lost loved ones and to the injured victims and to thank all the people who participated in so many ways helping victims or runners who were lost and confused and especially all of our public safety and medical responders and others who saved lives. We know this is very short notice, but we believe it is important to the healing process. Program details are in development. Members of the Brookline clergy will speak. The high school camarada will sing. And Chief O'Leary, O'Leary will give us uh, a um, picture of how our police officers were involved. And I believe Dr. Balsam will also talk to us about our emergency medical responders and how they were involved. Um, but we do want as many people as possible to come together with us Thursday at 7.30 p.m. at the Coolidge Corner Theater. Um, and then some other items. Um, this Friday, there will be a, in celebration of Arbor Day and Earth Week, a new disease-resistant elm will be planted to replace the historic Olmstead elm that was taken down in 2011. And on Saturday and Sunday, from noon to 5 p.m., their open stu studios will invite the public into artist workplaces around town. And also, there is an outdoor exhibit called Through the Trees along the Riverway Park between the Longwood MBTA stop and Park Drive. And finally, next Wednesday on May 1st at 7 p.m. in this room, Town Hall, there will be a public forum and community discussion on diversity with Ronald Marlowe, Assistant Secretary of Access and Opportunity, and Sandra Borders, Director of the Office of Diversity and Equal Opportunity of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. All are invited to attend and participate. And I'm sure other members have additional comments they would like to make. So, anybody? No? Are we going to discuss? Right. Um, the, the events, the marathon bombing. Sure. Events, yeah. Or? Go ahead. No? I, I was just doing announcements. You're oh. you're you're on. Oh, okay. Well, I, I just wanted to um, congratulate our police officers and uh, and all of our first responders and uh, everybody who worked so hard on Friday uh, with the the remarkable events of that day. Um, and thank. Brookline citizens for their participation. I also wanted to relate something that I became aware of today. You know, the, as the details of the story are becoming more known, it's becoming clearer and clearer that this all was all triggered by a uh, the, the lack of tolerance in a, in a, by a couple of people, um, um, a couple of people who uh, embodied intolerance and. Um, I heard a story today about how Trinity Church in, in Copley Square, uh, that the area had not been reopened in time for uh, their services on Sunday, and that Temple Israel, which is a uh, synagogue uh, on, the, on the riverway, um, stepped in and invited uh, the, the congregants of Trinity Church to uh, hold their Sunday services there that day. And uh, I know a lot of Brookline residents or, or members there. And uh, the account of it, uh, which I'd be happy to share with anyone, was, was so beautiful. They, they had a, um, a contingency of Temple Israel congregants there to welcome uh, the, the, the Trinity Church congregants. And it, it underscored for me that the message of intolerance that we heard, that we're hearing as a result of this bombing is so far the the minority, so, so so such a small segment of the of, of our community, and that the message of tolerance that is embodied and in, in, uh, and represented by by uh, Temple Israel opening their door for for Trinity Church is so predominantly the the rule in our in our society it made me made me proud. Yes. Other uh, comments from members of the board? Events you want to mention? I, I'm, I'm just sort of a, fo a footnote. Um, if you look in the uh, town seal up there, you'll see that Muddy uh, Brookline was called Muddy River when it was founded in 1630 and was part of Boston, and then became independently incorporated in 1705, and subsequently rejected Boston about 150 years later. 
but I would argue that we are still very closely connected, as close as you can be in a familial kind of relationship. Uh, we are a part of Boston, and Boston is a part of us. And I think we all felt that very much over the last week. So any other comments before we get to our next item? Uh, we have two people signed up for public comment. You want to come forward for public comment? Ms. Ames? Mariela Ames, Christine 15, town meeting member. I feel the obligation to come back to insist that you open your eyes and minds to what you are doing with respect to the issues we've been trying to address. An equal opportunity, an equal treatment, and thus lack of diversity in the town's workforce, boards, and commissions. I am going to touch three items. The pushing for no change Number two, your moratorium on appointments to the Human Relations Commission. Number three, the May 1st event. One, you have put a block at every turn in trying to avoid having to take a stand and make a decision, a decision of fairness. At first, it was the claim of the legal landscape regarding affirmative action. Then, it was the confusing language of the bylaws. Then it was the, let's refer the matter to the Committee on Town Organization and Structure before going to town meeting. Then you filed, uh, filed the warrant article seeking to eliminate the, the Human Relations Director position, while at the same time, paradoxically, decided to form a study committee. Added to this, you decided then that appointments to the commission should be put on hold. How else can these actions be interpreted other than blocking change and shying away from making a decision on a political and social issue of race relations in the town? On the moratorium on appointments to the commission, it was already shameful to treat two qualified candidates, one white, the other Hispanic, in such an unequal way. You claimed two weeks ago that the white candidate, Mr. Hochletner, was appointed in January 22nd before you knew about the articles, when in fact you had first-hand knowledge and suggested voluntary referral to the CTONS back on January 17. Ms. Daly came to the Commission's Diversity Committee meeting to talk specifically about this referral. This is in our minutes. The white candidate was affirmatively recruited by you, Selectman, and was summarily appointed a Commission member one week after his interview when you had full knowledge about the articles. Articles 9 and 10, as a matter of fact, do not seek to change the Commission's responsibilities relative to race relations. Currently, three applicants of color, Mr. Sanabria, Mr. Tyndall, and Mr. Conquest, with genuine interest and actual expertise on the issues of race relations, have been placed on hold. While the study committee studies the issue, comes up with recommendations which may not change the responsibility of race relations. Well, these candidates are fully aware of the current affairs and potential changes, and it should be up to them to withdraw their application or resign when the time comes if they don't agree with any new charter ultimately established for the commission. If you educated selectmen act this way with educated volunteer candidates, I can only imagine what happens with, with low-level workers who have to endure from white people they work for. Your actions have a great in, grave impact on how people of color are treated in this town. Please conclude. Allow me to talk about the uh, weak uh, May 1st event, as you mentioned. You have read the policy. You're allowed three minutes. You've exceeded it. I'm going to be generous and allow you to continue, but please conclude. I will. Uh, you mentioned the event on May 1st, where top officers of the Affirmative Action Office from Governor Patrick will be uh, here. They were initially invited by the Diversity Committee. The goal was for all to learn, especially the different <coughs> department heads in the town, 
to which affirmative action plans may apply more than others. You were also invited, but the decision to change the venue and the date was made um, then to May 1st by uh, you and Ms. McNally. I hope that the event does not turn into a self-congratulatory opportunity for the town to claim how your administration is committed to diversity. But I do ask you still that you all selectmen and town administrator be present there and require that all department heads be present as well. It is my hope that the event focuses on best practices, challenges, and answers to questions from the administration, employees, and the public. Thank you. this um, budget summaries uh, the FY financial plan. And in this document, which is distributed, there's an appendix three. And I recommend that everybody in town look at appendix three. And appendix three is the organizational Town of Brookline organizational chart. And at the top of the chart are citizens. And there are a number of us citizens in town are deeply concerned about the civic illiteracy that folks have about this organizational chart because we have heard, I have heard expressions like, well, they're just citizens, okay? That statement was made by the chair of the Human Resource Board in a meeting at CTOS, just citizens. And I said to the chair, I said to him, what do you mean just citizens? Have you seen Mel's organizational chart? Oh yeah, who's on top? Citizens. Now, we have a serious problem in this town. There's going to be an election April 30th. Generally, there'll be two ballots. And if past experience is correct, in the local election, there will be low voter, voter turnout, 7 8%. We have an unopposed candidate for selecting. The reason why I'm saying this is that this issue that we've been struggling with as commissioners on the Human Relations Commission has now migrated to scores of committees and groups in town. And the latest group will be, um, I guess, some select committee of citizens to examine diversity or whatever. And I'm saying this, OK? that the impact and the perception, the optics, don't look pretty. And it's very, very sad because the feeling and the impact is, is that, well, here we go again, creating another maze. And the other thing is this, very frankly, 30, 40 years experience working with study committees on race, blue ribbon study committees, they always lead to blue babies. So in the meantime, Blue ribbon commissions lead to blue babies when it comes to race. So my hope is that the BOS, who are um, elected by the citizens, who are at the top of their organizational chart, will seriously consider um, making appointments to the Human Relations Commission because whether it's Article Please conclude. Article and it's got nothing to do with the commissioners on human relations. Thank you. Okay, next item uh, will be uh, on our miscellaneous calendar, and we're going to hold the minutes uh, for later. Um, so I believe, Mr. Cirillo, if you'd come forward, we're going to hear about issuing a sale of bonds.
Good evening, Stephen Cirillo, Finance Director. Uh, I appear before you this evening to uh, ask permission uh, to refinance some older bonds. Uh, these are the 2005 and 2006 bonds. We've done an analysis, uh, and uh, we it meets the criteria uh, for savings, roughly about uh, three percent, uh, and the ratio. Uh, the savings aren't great. Uh, it's it would be a difficult uh, refinancing in that it's uh, the bo the bar the bonds that we're attempting to refinance are older than 10 years, which means that we have to advance refund a portion of it and then refinance the remaining 10 years or the last 10 years of each of those bonds. Uh, when we did the analysis, uh, the analysis was, was based on interest rates as of April 9th. And so I just want to be clear that when we get to the point of the bond sale, if the, uh, the numbers changed, I would, I would recommend we would pull out of this. So this, uh, this vote that you're taking tonight would allow me to pursue it would not lock the town in unless, in the end, you finally authorize it. Any questions for Mr. Cirillo? No. no. Uh, would you like us to vote you authorization uh, conditionally or just simply vote you authorization assuming that you'll come back if you feel the need to change? Uh, I'm required to come back. Okay, so. fine. <laughs> so I move that we approve uh, authorizing the treasurer to provide for a sale and issuance of bonds under General Laws Chapter 44, Section 21A. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Viola, actually, um, I'm going to pause for a moment. We have a very long list here. Uh, board members, would you care to flag items you want to discuss? Are there any that you do not want to discuss or could vote? And we'll, we'll go through the questions and uh, then we'll take the uh, ones that we don't need to have a presentation on. So, I had checked uh, B. D? B as in boy. B as in boy, okay. We, we just did that. Yep. F, H, J. Okay. M and O is an owl. Yeah, I want E also. Okay. All right. Um, I didn't hear anybody asking for G. Is that right? G. G? I think F G is, H. G is sort of part and with well, that's kind of what I thought. Yeah. yeah, right. So I guess we'll do those together. All right. Um, and I is sort of part. That's true, too. Okay, and um, all right. And K and L talk about <laughs> rebates. So. It's starting to sound like Sesame Street. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, I believe I've heard uh, a desire to hold or for, to discuss, okay, E, F, G, and H, and I guess that's going to be I and J, as well as O, and not the others, which might mean we're not going to have Mr. Viola talk to us about the hub agreement. Just looking nope. chagrined. I know. <laughs> you know. Do, do Would you wanna, love to hear about do you it? Talk briefly about it, Mr. Viola. Briefly. I think it's got to do with some accounting. Well, they're going to offer monthly memberships. Monthly yeah, membership. right, right. Which is not a bad thing. Good evening, Joe Viola, Assistant Director for Community Planning. Uh, and you're exactly right. This is uh, an amendment to the existing MOA between the City of Boston, Somerville, Cambridge, Brookline, and Alta. And what we're looking to do is to, Alta's hoping to offer a, a monthly membership option. Currently, you, you can do a one day, a three day, or an annual membership. And we're hoping to be able to offer a monthly membership to, uh, you know, to increase the membership base. And it's in direct response to some of the uh, some of the surveys that Alta did last year with existing members. Have Cambridge and Somerville agreed to these yet? I should note, yes, that actually Cambridge and Somerville have approved the two okay. MOA amendments. Boston mm -hmm. is waiting for Brookline to, ah. <laughs> to move forward. So, okay. so two of the right. four have, have agreed to it. All right. Good. Um, second yeah. amendment is simply looking at how uh, revenue, or excuse me, how refunds are processed and sort of tweaking the process for how they're currently Currently, it's it's pretty labor intensive, and they're trying to make it more simplistic by uh, looking at 
revenue and, and linking the uh, the uh, amount of uh, refunds that are uh, that happen each month based on the amount of revenue and mis uh, municipality takes in with regard to uh, running the program. Questions for Mr. Viola? Yeah. Is, is there any bottom line impact? I mean, the, the first would increase revenue, presumably. Right. The second, what is the impact on Brookline? As best I can tell, and the numbers I use were from last year's operations. We haven't gotten into this year. I did a calculation, and it basically showed that the amount of money we would pay out for reven for refunds is actually less based on what the current system is. And ag again, that's only based on three months. But it actually looks like our responsibility for the overall amount of refunds that are issued on a monthly basis would decrease. Under, so they would decrease under the proposed? Under the proposed, okay. yes. Any other questions? No. Okay. <clears throat> Then I move that we approve and authorize the chairman to execute the following amendments to the MOA between the town of Brookline, City of Boston, City of Cambridge, City of Somerville, and Alta Bicycle Share, effective March 7th, 2012. Uh, item one, monthly memberships that the participating municipalities and Alta offer a monthly membership option or purchase as part of the regional bike share system, and two, to attribute refunds to casual subscribers, um, actually to amend the uh, MOA to address refunds to casual subscribers. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you. Thank you. And I believe we are not discussing the contract for the senior center renovation. However, we would like to talk about the fitness room. Somebody, yep, Ruth Ms. Ann Dobek? Yeah. Ruth Ann Dobek, director of the Brooklyn Town Forum. Navy you just Navy. need to move a little bit to your right to get near the microphone. There you go. Thank oh, you. Not in the mic? <laughs> yes. There you go. Okay. You got it. Usually my voice carries. Ruth Ann Dobek, director of the Brooklyn Council on Aging Senior Center. Um, I'm here for, uh, to ask for um, the signing of the contract for the architectural services for the fitness center. This is a project that will bring um, the fitness center from the basement up to the second floor, create some medical um, usage space on the second floor, and office space, and then will allow us to renovate where the current fitness center and the senior center uh, to usable classroom space. Um, we have 80% of the funding for the entire project in hand, 108000 from C CDBG and um, a $30,000 grant from Brookline Healthcare and an additional um, 60000 from the nonprofit. Uh, we do need to continue our fundraising for new fitness equipment and other furniture and AV, but the in renovation project is funded. So this is, you re may remember they had the adult daycare in the building before, and it's, uh, this is what's going to go into that space now that they've moved out. And it's, um, I mean, the senior center, every time I go over there, and I'm over there pretty frequently, is absolutely filled to the gills. Um, people love it and they come there and so this is going to be a great um, additional much needed space. And it will be out of the basement which probably will be very appealing for people. Yes, well, although we're going to turn the basement in, we have to come up with a new name for basement, lower oh. level, <laughs> lounge, something okay, to make right. that. It's, it's the garden level. The yes, garden, the garden level. level. <laughs> Because even though the fitness center will now be moved up to the second floor, we intend to make that into usable classroom space. So ah, okay. The garden. Classroom. The garden. Right. Right. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Any other questions for Ms. Dobek? I, I yep. actually just, and, and this may not be a question for Ms. Dobek, um, the coding, um, sh um, th there's the amount of contract is 19100 Just I'm just looking at the cover memo that we received. And was the coding for 45? Yes. What That's is the entire um, budget for CDBG in that code. 
change. Okay. So, so the, 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 the contract that I'm... You have an updated I'm version. Ah, okay. I, I had not gotten the updated version. All right. Okay. I guess I did get it, and I didn't see it. All right. Thank you. All right. I'm going to move both D and E because they seem to be associated together. Um, the first one is the uh, s extension of a CDBG contract. That's, um, I think, integral to this whole thing. So I move that we approve and authorize the chairman to execute a contract extension for the FY 2012 Brookline Senior Center renovation project and move that we approve and execute a contract with John Caitlin and Associates uh, for services in connection with the renovation of the fitness room at the Senior Center. All in favor of items D and E, please say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Benka? Aye. Selectman Goldstein? Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank Go you. for it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, I believe, Mr. Pepesturgeon, sewers and sidewalks. Good evening. First contract is for uh, sewer system rehabilitation, and that's in the amount of $480,590. We're recommending award to the low bidder. In situ, in situ form technologies. Uh, they've done work for us many times in the past. Uh, the work consists basically of cleaning and slip lining uh, sewer mains, manhole sealing uh, to keep uh, uh, surface water out. It's generally going to be in the area of the Elliott Street area, Cleveland Road, Beaconsfield Road, uh, and some uh, track crossings on Beacon Street itself. Uh, this work doesn't involve opening up the entire street. It involves access holes, and then uh, we do most of the work underground. So that's the first contract. If there are any questions on that. Questions? Selectman Daly. I, I thought we'd finished all that work. That no. Question. Soil work? No. Never. We finished all the Never. water work. This is, <laughs> this is wastewater stuff. Oh, the water okay. work was finished years ago. We're getting to the glamour stuff now. I swear I had, the, I had the same question. For some reason I had it in my head that we had... No, you're, conf you're confusing it with the cleaning and lining program on the water distribution system that was completed in 2000. Uh, we do uh, projects every year on sewer system rehabilitation, on stormwater uh, drain improvements, uh, uh, and as you'll hear in the next contract, uh, we do uh, spot repairs uh, b based on pipeline inspections for, pu for sections of pipe that either collapsed or cracked or, or an eminent... Uh, danger of collapsing, uh, and that's the second contract. Uh, we do split the contracts uh, into separate contracts because they're two completely distinct types of work, and uh, we get a better price uh, when we split the, uh, the work. How well, much was this budgeted for? Uh, for all the soil work? No, this, this particular contract. Did this was for 480, 80, almost $481,000. What does this accomplish? What does it accomplish? This first, this first uh, the slip lining this, contract? No, the sewer rehabilitation. The sewer system rehabilitation is for slip lining sewers. Okay. Uh, this uh, allows us to do, uh, th uh, through completely underground work, uh, wh what we actually do is we build a brand new pipeline inside the old pipeline. But, but Andy, maybe the question he might be asking you is it's to stop the loss, right? Well. The leaks. It, I'm getting to that. Sorry. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's to improve the structural capacity of the pipe. We have a lot of pipes that are built out of vitrified clay. They're cracked. Uh, okay. they're, they're egg shape. Uh, the joints are all open. So by pulling in a, a uh, complete slip lining into these pipes, we restore the structural integrity of the pipe. And at the same time, we're sealing the pipe, so we're keeping groundwater out of it. Uh, so that, uh, as you can imagine, groundwater infiltration into sewers, we're paying for that. Uh, so this is designed to keep groundwater out of the pipe. Kind of like putting a stent. Kind of like that, yes, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. The second contract, though, is for a different type of work, and that's to actually, uh, do, through cut and cover, actually dig up and replace sections of sewer that are either collapsed or in imminent danger of collapsing. Uh, it's to take care of deficiencies that are that are found all during the year through the Water and Sewer Division's Pipeline Inspection Program, 
that we wait and then annually we put out one large contract to take care of all those deficiencies at once. Does this second contract involve uh, opening the, uh, it, we're digging down and working? Yes. Okay. Yes. Do you know where this will be? These, this contract is, is all over the place. Okay. It's spot repairs in probably, you know, 30 or 40 different places throughout town. Okay. Any major uh, street opening, street closures that we should expect to uh, I don't believe be seeing? so. Okay. No, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty innocuous, this work. Sort of a discreet yeah. location here and there? Yes. Okay. The, the thing you should note on this contract, though, is we're not asking you to award to the low bidder. Right. Yeah. Uh, we're asking you to award to the second bidder, and in our experience, well, we ask for uh, uh, the contractors to provide their references and experience. In this case, that we didn't feel that the low bidder had a sufficient amount of experience in this work to undertake a project of this size, uh, so therefore we uh, recommend award to the second bidder. Was the five years of experience in the RFP? Yes. Okay. Other questions for Mr. Pepsturgeon? While I've got and you we've there, got Andy, two more. I uh, guess you might as well walk us through all of them. Can I just ask you quickly, unrelated, Dean Road, wait, what, what's going on there? It's Dean Road? Yeah, it looks it's like there's a major. I think it's a national grid project. Who yeah, we're not working on Dean. Mr. Ditto. Dean Road is scheduled to be reconstructed this year. That being said, we notified all the utilities that have utilities in that street to do, if they can upgrade them, now is the time to upgrade them. So, and National Grid will be in there. Uh, they may be in there right now. They are in there now. So um, they'll be there for quite a while because they got to relay the name for the whole length. The patches that they've put into the trenches that they dug are so, are so insufficient. They're so far below the grade of the rest of it. It's, it's, it's really uh, very difficult to travel there. Okay, we'll, we'll take a look at that tomorrow. Uh, the third contract is for uh, the repair of cement concrete sidewalks. This is an annual contract we put out uh, that uh, augments our own in-house uh, sidewalk replacement crews. Uh, this is contractual. The low bid on this was uh, 494 dollars However, uh, again, in our a review of the submissions and the bids. Uh, we felt that the low bidder in this case did not have the necessary experience for cement concrete work. Uh, he was primarily uh, uh, experienced with asphalt bituminous concrete work uh, and there is a, a distinct difference. So again, we're recommending award to the second bidder allied paving corporation for $501,400. Okay. Uh, the next contract is for the uh, reconstruction of uh, Rangeley Road and Princeton Road. This is a Chapter 90 project uh, similar to the uh, work that was done last year on Beverly Road uh, and what's currently concluding on Williston and Salisbury Road, all Chapter 90 projects. This project has been approved by Mass DOT uh, and the low, we're recommending approval to the low bidder, which is aggregate. Uh, industries aggregate was the same contractor that uh, did Beverly Road last year uh, and is currently finishing up Williston and Salisbury Road. Uh, the low bid amount in this case is $479,567.40. More questions? Yeah. Andy, when, when you're not awarding to the low bidder, um, have you checked this with town council and with uh, uh, the purchasing, Dave Gin Ginnikakis? Yes. Yes, and in both cases, they conclude they conf uh, concurred with our opinion. Okay, on that, that yes. they did not meet the requirements of the RFP. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah, we we don't do this uh, without a, uh, running through town council. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? No. All right. Then I move that we award contract number PW. 12-34, sewer system rehabilitation in the amount of $480,590 to in situ form technologies, LLC. I move that we award contract number PW13-14, sewer and drain improvements in the amount of $262,995 to Aqualine Utility, 
Incorporated. I move that we award contract number PW12-23, repair of cement concrete sidewalks in the amount of $501,400 to Allied Paving Corporation. And I move that we award and execute contract number PW12-27, Rangeley Road and Princeton Road reconstruction in the amount of $479,567.40 to Aggregate Industries. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Papasturgeon. Uh, next is uh, design services, no, um, consultants peer review uh, at Cleveland Circle. Mr. Ditto. Yes. This is a uh, request to accept a gift of $13,800 from the developer for the uh, Cleveland Circle Cinema Project uh, Boston Design Group. This is uh, again for uh, the town's peer review of this project and the scope of work, among other things, includes a review of the transportation impact study and access plan, evaluation uh, of the compliance of, with the zoning regulations on the lot in the town of Brookline, and uh, responding also to neighbors' specific request site specific request uh, in itself. Uh, I might at this time just give a very brief update as to where the project stands. This is a multi-jurisdictional project with uh, the Boston Redevelopment Authority taking the, uh, the lead on it. To date, um, the draft project impact report has been filed with the BRA. The BRA is holding public hearings on that draft report. The town of Brookline has commented on the report as well as commented on uh, several site specific issues, particularly the location of the entrance to the site as well as the uh, internal circulations. Um, again, this will pay for the town's consultant to do the peer review of this project. Questions for Mr. Ditto? Yeah, just just no. a comment there. Um, <laughs> Under the BRA process, uh, I believe that the time for comment on this uh, has been extended to May 10th, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and um, uh, that there, there are comments that uh, uh, Butters and Brighton are certainly going to be making, as I understand it, there's a very active group in, in the Alston Brighton area. Um, uh, Butters in, in Brookline, uh, I think, will be commenting on it. Um, and then uh, it is subject to uh, our um, design review process in Brookline, uh, insofar as the, we have a design review over the facade that faces Brookline, uh, whether it is in Boston or it's in Brookline. That was part of our zoning change uh, and uh, something that the developer agreed to, I believe. So um, this process is certainly going to be ongoing. Okay, we ready? Ready. Then I move that we accept $13,800 from Boston Design Group the developer of Cleveland Circle, the Cleveland Circle Cinema Project to fund the town's on-call consultant peer review of proposed development at the Cleveland Circle Cinema site. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you, Mr. Ditto. Um, so maybe we'll vote K, L, M, and N. Um, and I think I'm going to do these by moving them in the language as printed on the calendar. Are there any members who wish to um, change that motion? Um, can I just make a comment? Yep. I just want to say on the um, uh, rebate checks from NSTAR that please, I don't see Mr. Simmons here anymore, but um, I, kn I know he Mr. always- Mr. Wigley's in the back, you can yes. tell him. <laughs> yes, uh, and, and one of these was for um, our Runkle school work. And I guess the other one's lead streetlights, so that's not Mr. Simmons either. That's it. But anyway, um, I, I appreciate all the work that everyone does to get to have the maximum 
energy savings in our buildings to um, to get these rebates whenever possible and and uh, thank you to all of you who worked on these projects okay um, I'm moving items K L M and N in the language as printed in the calendar there are two energy rebates and a change order for a Heath School renovation, and finally, architectural services for a masonry studies, a masonry condition study for town buildings. All in favor of items K, L, M, and N, please say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Benka? Aye. Selectman Goldstein? Aye. Chair votes aye. And the next item is. Thank you, uh, Ray. For <laughs> <laughs> um, Lawrence School Modular Classrooms, Mr. Gwigley. Good evening. This is contract amendment number one to the contract with Flensburg Architect, and uh, if approved tonight, it would extend their services through design development, construction, uh, bid documents, bidding assistance, and construction administration for uh, modular classrooms at the Lawrence School. This uh, uh, contract amendment has been favorably voted by both the Building Commission and School Committee, and it is in the amount of $60,000. Questions? Yeah. Selectman Goldstein? Question. Uh, on the, uh, the project description contract letter, in the heading, it, it says, Modular Classroom Proposal Letter Lawrence and Baker Schools, and then, but in the, the regarding line, the Ray line, it just seems to be talking about Lawrence schools. So y yes, this refers only to the Lawrence schools. At the current time, the school department has, is not, at the moment at least, not pursuing modulars at Baker. Okay, so the, so the heading at the top of Flansburg's letter where it says Lawrence and Baker schools, that's in error. This is, it's sim this is only Lawrence, that's correct. I'm sorry about that. It may have been originally that was the RFP, though. You yeah, know. the original I, I the mean, original I think contract that was, right? the original yeah. contract mm -hmm. does refer to both schools, right. and they did right. some uh, study work and preliminary costing and siting at both schools. So that's why right. we have this information because that is the actual contract. Right. So, do but we this have is an amendment to that contract. Do we have some savings anticipated then, since we're not moving forward with Baker at this point. Yes. Well, we won't be building. Well, I know I understand, <laughs> but of the contract that that we originally envisioned, envisioned for the the architectural services and the planning for these for these modular classrooms, originally the contract included Baker. It doesn't include Baker anymore. So, is there any part of that contract that that we're not going to be spending? Th this is a no, because originally we only did the original contract was to study both sites, and. Uh, which they did in site and provide costing. This is an extension of that contract pertaining to Lawrence only. And is the design of the modular classrooms? I think uh, the question construction going documents. Was, uh, they're going are we ahead. Save some m b budget money. That what what we had budgeted for this. Uh, for that, that's not determined as of yet because we don't know the cost of these. But obviously, if we're not building anything at, at Baker for the moment, then there's not a cost there. I think we have a confusion about the question. I, originally, Flansburg was asked to investigate both sites, and only one site was identified by the school committee for actual modulars. So the first part of the contract is completed, correct? Correct. And I think maybe you were being asked, was there any savings because we did not go forward with two schools? No, because the, the original contract right was to study both sites and site modulars at both sites, provide budgetary cost assessment at both sites, which they completed. And based on that information, the school department has, well, partly based on that information, the school department is now directing its efforts to the Lawrence School. Yes, to only modular classrooms only at Lawrence. This is construction and bid documents for four classrooms at Lawrence. Right, I they were that. specifically asked to provide a, 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 this contract amendment for uh, uh, bid documents, bidding, and construction administration only for the Lawrence School. And the, so now we're spending another $60,000 to come up with some more specific plans for the 
while in school, right? P plans, RFP, uh, okay. bidding assistance, construction administration, so I guess the question meetings. Is, was there a specific? Was there a similar amount of money, sixty thousand dollars, let's say, that's been budgeted to do the same at the Baker School that we're now not spending? No, we never got that far. This is specifically to the Lawrence School. I, mean, the, I, I suppose one question would be uh, what the scope was of any vote of town meeting with respect That's to fine. this. But this is just out of, uh, I assume, out of the general classroom capacity budget. Yeah. Correct. So that, right. So that can be used uh, in any way that's necessary to meet classroom capacity needs. But oh, to that's the right. larger question, if there are only going to be modulars at one location, there is probably savings overall out of the classroom fund. I yeah, thought but this had been a specific capital expenditure that we, we had planned on. But I, guess I don't think so. Nice. I think it's that budget for classroom expansion, which that's has right. multi possibilities in it. Okay. Um, I. I actually do have one question. I've, I've seen at least four different uh, plans or potential plans for yes. the Lawrence School, one level, two levels, yes. two. Has, have any of those been decided on at this point? No, we okay. haven't decided on any. Uh, I think we're going to, we need out of necessity, I believe, to meet the program and enrollment needs to have four classrooms. Okay. We did have a community meeting that was very well attended uh, uh, and we got a lot of good information out of that. And uh, uh, so we're considering all of the comments, but I really think we need to strive for four classrooms there. And, uh, uh, but no decision has been made on what the actual configuration will be at this time. Did any, I, I don't recall any that went beyond four. Did any, did any of those alternatives include more than four classrooms? No, we were looking only at two or four. Okay. Two, three, and four, but nothing beyond four. Okay. And, yep. and as I read this contract, uh, we could do two or four. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if, if it might be three. I'm wondering why it doesn't say two, two, four classrooms. Um, there won't be an argument if we do three. I'm certain of that. How and, about and, the and, fact and that, that this is really a school committee decision, yeah. and no, therefore? No, 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 no. I'm just, I'm, what I'm asking about, uh, Betsy, is just the, the terminology of the contract. We, we're essentially agreeing to a fixed price contract. Yes. Uh, and, and the scope could either be two or four. It says up to four. Right. But the actual contract is two or four. And I, I, I think I agree with you. We'll just let it go. Yeah, and I think... Um, we won't get an argument if there's three. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, and I, and I did, add, you know, I tried to get some information from Flansburg as, well, if we wind up with two, there's not that much of a delta right. in the design work. So I couldn't really, it was, there was, I wasn't going to get anywhere with, you know, if we go with two, we're going to get a get design a saving. Get some money yeah, no, yeah, no. So, yeah. but by the same token, they, they won't give us an argument if there's three. Yeah. I know the, the, the plan for three, I think, was all on one floor. Right. Whereas the four would be stacked. Right. Or could be stacked. Could so, be. Yeah. Could be. And actually, one of the things that one of their latest iterations was to uh, turn the stacked four classrooms 180 degrees, that which helps pulling it back from some of the, the neighbors. And we have to look into whether okay. or not that, you know, what the ramifications of that are. But we're really studying this here because we want to make the most of a tight site and work with the community and Good. we have to meet the needs of the school too so we'll we'll get it done Good. okay thank if you. you approve it thank you okay I move that we approve and execute an amendment with Flansburg architects in the amount of sixty thousand dollars in connection with the Lawrence School modular classroom project all in favor please say aye selectman Daly aye selectman Binka aye selectman Goldstein aye chair votes aye thank finally you. Thank you, Mr. Gwigley. Thank Items you. P, Q, R, S, and T are all for temporary alcoholic beverage uh, licenses. One Pine Manor College on April 27th, one for the Heath School on April 27th, one for the Pierce School on April 27th, one for the Driscoll School on April 27th, and finally Boston University on May 
23rd. Any questions from members of the board? April 27th is going to be a big day. Very in town. big yeah, night. Stay off yeah. the roads. <laughs> okay. Uh, all in favor of uh, granting temporary licenses as listed in the calendar. Some are all kinds and some are wine and malt, and I'm not going to separate yeah, them out. All right. Items P, Q, R, S, and T. Please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Binka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Chair votes aye. Next item, Senior Health Fair. Ms. Yes. Dobeck, please come back. <laughs> well, while she's getting up there, I will, I will start. We have a very exciting event coming up on May 2nd, starting at 10 o'clock in the morning, going till 3 in the afternoon. And um, it's, it's a Senior Health Fair, and um, it's, it's, we've got a lot of really great stuff scheduled. I think it's going to be pretty, pretty interesting. And Ruth Ann, if you want to tell them about some of the specifics and also the lunch. Sure. Thing. Okay. We want to invite all our seniors um, and any of the public that wants to really um, get some health tips, talks, and treats. This is co-sponsored by our neighbors, Hebrew Senior Life as a um, good opportunity to introduce the community to some of their health services. The town is well represented. In addition to Nancy, who has worked tirelessly as our committee, we are being um, co-sponsored by the Public Health Division. And there's going to be a mini town hall with library and recreation participating. The police department will be uh, displaying the LOJEC Alzheimer's uh, return safety. Um, Don Sieber is going to be doing some emergency preparedness. There's going to be safety in terms of what your house should look like without clutter. Um, some tips on what to buy from Connolly's Hardware has donated some um, good techniques. And the morning will start at 10, as Nancy said. There'll be complimentary lunch for the first 100 seniors who sign up. So we're urging people for early registration. They can call the Senior Center's main number at 617-730-2770. There's a surprise with the lunch. I, um, it's called Laughter and Lunch, because we all know that laughter really helps um, delay the stress and help us age. And there's a special guest that I guess could be called a comedian, but um, that will be one of our surprises. The, the morning will also include some talks by Dr. Robert Schreibner, a local geriatrician on healthy aging. Vigorous Mind will be doing a presentation to keep us all healthy and active. And as I said, there's going to be some interactions, some Tai Chi, some stretching. Um, gift bags will be given to the first hundred registrars, and it should be a wonderful day. So we're urging everyone to sign up and attend. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of good things. A but lot I, I of just, good things. I just want to say in particular um, that the, we're really very pleased, I think, with this partnership we're having with the Hebrew Senior Life. They have centered communities in Brookline, so they are the largest um, landlords for um, seniors. Um, their buildings are all seniors. Some of the units are um, um, some of the units are subsidized units, so below, below market. And, and um, they got a grant from Covidian, um, who is helping, you know, with um, some of the money for advertising this and, and um, the things that are going in the goodie bags and stuff like that. And it's, it's, um, it's Dorothy Kelly Gay, who's a a dynamo, uh, who's the, the head of the um, um, center communities, um, was saying it's not always um, the case that you have this kind of partnership between the, the public entity, the senior center, the Council on Aging, and the, the, the private or semi-private entities of the Hebrew senior life people. So it's um, we've been working together very well, and we're very pleased. Um, to be offering, be able to get together and offer an event that I think is going to be very uh, interesting and nice for people, and we're, we're expecting quite a good crowd. Yeah, so we really advise people to, to sign up. Give us a call if you have any questions, and really want to thank the whole community, the, the town departments, 
um, Center Communities, Hebrew Senior Life, and Covidia for their support, which we think will be a, a wonderful event for healthy aging. Sounds wonderful, um, and I hope everyone who uh, is aging, as some of us are, will come and learn everything there is in the way of good resources in the I, town I of Brookline. I've already said to sign me up for the Vigorous Mind session, because <laughs> I, I, right. I need it. A quick question. Sure. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I, last year we had um, a, a foundation appear before us uh, which supported the low jack Alzheimer's mm -hmm. um, system and I'm wondering if they are still supporting that. But we are going to have the police department is participating and that that is one of the things they'll be sort of demonstrating and right yeah. yeah I think there's still a little bit of money and whether or not it's renewed we'll probably find out um, when that ends, but I believe there's been a commitment to, to continue that project. Okay, because that, so the, I mean, it was the Hamilton Charitable Foundation Correct. that was supporting that, and um, as, as long as we're recognizing entities that are uh, supporting this effort, um, they were also involved in that, and I would hope they would renew their Absolutely. I, again, that we hope so. That's a very important, uh, and as Nancy said, the police department will be there demonstrating it. Good. Uh, for people who were not around when we discussed this in the first, the first time, it's actually a sort of locator system for individuals with Alzheimer's who could wander off and uh, it allows them to be, where their, their, pre you know, their location to be identified. And then the police, yes, if, if somebody's missing, right. the police are able police to locate them, them in a very right. timely fashion. Right. Exactly. So it's very important. And um, what Selectman Banco was referencing is that the Hamilton Charitable Foundation uh, gave a donation to subsidize the cost of this for low-income families. And I should mention that it's not just for elders, but it's also good if um, somebody has an autistic child and the same system is, you know, allows you to find that child. So it's right. a multi-generational approach. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, thank you. Thank, thank you. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yep. Okay, I don't think we need to do anything other than say this is, seems like a wonderful event, and we hope that it will be very, very successful. Uh, next item, uh, Selectman Daly, I believe you have the initiative on this one. Yes, this is our Committee on Diversity, Equal Employment Opportunities and Affirmative Action, and I, I respectfully have to disagree with the uh, people we had uh, here for public comment. I think there's a, the, a lot to be studied of, and certainly some change needed on the bylaw dealing with the Human Relations Commission, which is over 40 years old. And um, I have uh, got, reached out to some people, some people um, stepped up and we're willing to um, serve on this committee, and I think it's really a, quite an impressive group, and I think we, we will learn a lot about the current state of the law in this area and about, uh, you know, uh, maybe innovative ideas for the role of the Human Relations Commission going forward. And so let me just briefly run down and tell you um, who, who is going to be on the committee or who I'm proposing, anyway. Um, I would... Um, be our representative to the committee, uh, Rita McNally, who is acting chair of the um, Human Relations Youth Resources Commission and a long-serving member of that commission, a member of the MLK Celebration Committee, and a member of the, too many other committees for me to even uh, uh, relate here uh, would serve. Um, Ken Kernos, who is the chair of the Human Resources Board, has agreed to join us. Um, Bernard Green um, would be the advisory committee representative. He um, is a town meeting member. He's legal counsel for Mass Water Pollution Abatement Trust. He happens to be an African American. Um, Marty Rosenthal, a town meeting member. He's a, an also, I, I will admit, we're kind of, we're pretty heavy on lawyers here. Uh, yeah, I think, I think everybody um, so far, uh, I think we have one non-lawyer. On Good. I, I, I'm for, I'm for one at least non-lawyer. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, you should know I'm the only non-lawyer non of the four of us, just so that you get it. <laughs> but Marty served on the Citizen Complaint Committee. He also worked many years ago on police regulations concerning uh, 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 racial profiling and how to avoid it. 
Um, Judy Levinson is a lawyer uh, with Brody Hardoon. She is formerly from the Civil Rights Division of the Attorney General's Office. Um, and before that, she was with the Math Mass Ethics Commission. She currently practices employment law. Grace Lee um, is uh, with a lawyer with Eckerd Siemens. She uh, was formerly first deputy treasurer and general counsel for the Massachusetts State Treasury. She's worked on anti-discrimination issues in the AG's office and um, dealt with recently was the employment practices person on the transition team for the inspector general's office. And I might add the ins new inspector general is a former school committee member right. from Brookline, Glen Cunha. Um, she is also chair of the Commonwealth Massachusetts of Massachusetts Asian American Commission. Um, and she, uh, she is an Asian American, and she serves on the Board of Directors of Community Resources for Justice. Um, Malcolm Cawthorn, who's our only non-lawyer, is a history and African American studies teacher at Brookline High School. He has been a participant for a number of years now in our MLK celebration in Brookline and uh, worked with the Hidden Brookline Committee. And then and I believe he's a Brookline High School graduate. He yeah. is. He is. Yeah, grew up in Brookline. So. Um, Elena Olson, uh, who was born and raised in Argentina, um, is executive director of the Multi Multicultural Affairs Office of Massachusetts General Hospital and uh, a member of their Diversity uh, Committee and Health Disparities Committee. And I didn't write it on here, but also a lawyer, I'm so <laughs> sorry to say. So uh, <laughs> don't, don't apologize. <laughs> anyway, I think it's, uh, it's actually uh, uh, some very uh, people with very relevant skills, and uh, I think it will be an interesting committee. I congratulate Comments? you, Selectman Daly. I think it seems like a uh, like an excellent and very uh, expert committee that you've uh, assembled here. Uh, there was a comment early about blue ribbon panels and and uh, with, with uh, pessimistic results, but I, I don't see how a committee of uh, of this makeup can't come up with some very useful. I hope so. Guidance. Yeah. Like Thank you. Yeah. No. no. Okay. Um, and, and I will just add that there was a really uh, lengthy and thoughtful uh, process that established the bylaw in the first place um, that was adopted in 1970. And we all believe, we the Board of Selectmen believe, that it is has served us well, but is in need of being brought into the 21st century. Um, and therefore would continue to serve us well into the future. And this seems to me to be a very well-qualified group to advise us as to uh, what the modifications should be in the bylaw. And I hope it will have time to take a very uh, thoughtful approach and come back to us with recommendations that um, will really serve us for the same length of time that the first bylaw did back in 1970. Yeah, and I think I'm, I'm also intending to ask from this group who are, as I say, uh, many of them experts in this area, for um, some, some of their thoughts on what the current state of the law is in this area. Okay, uh, motion to appoint the um, nine members uh, that we've just had read off. I'm not gonna read them again. Uh, to the Committee on Diversity, Equal Opportunity, and Affirmative Action. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Chair votes aye. Finally, sorry folks, one hour late, we are at food trucks. Tasty and delicious. And mobile. And mobile. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Alan Balsam, Public Health and Human Services. Um, and I'll be presenting with Andy uh, Marna from uh, Planning and Community Development. We've worked together on, on this uh, from the beginning. You may recall a year and a half ago, uh, Mr. Kleckner asked uh, me to chair a committee to bring food trucks or to entertain the possibility of bringing food trucks into Brookline. We went through a, a lengthy planning process, issued a request for proposals after identifying sites, um, launched a pilot program, tried to learn a few things from that, extended the pilot program, and we're now to the point where we're going into phase two. Um, we also did a, a bit of an evaluation. Uh, I was 
mostly involved in an evaluation of the food sanitation and safety aspects, and I was very pleased with the results of that evaluation. Um, Andy's group looked at other parameters as well. So we're presenting uh, the results of the latest RFP to you. What you'll notice is it looks in some ways remarkably similar to the old program in terms of locations, but we do have, I believe, four new operators, and um, I'll let Andy tell you all about it. Uh, Andy Martineau, Economic Development Planner for the town. Uh, as Alan said, we issued an RFP that yielded the uh, select, or recommendation, rather, of the 10 trucks in the schedule you have before you. Uh, it's largely the same. Uh, big changes would be uh, filling in the vacant shifts that were previously approved. Uh, we only had five trucks, so they can only do so many shifts. Uh, and then one potential location that would be new to the schedule, but not new to the program, and that's the Harvard Street and Auburn Street location. Um, Clover would be doing one shift uh, once per week there. Um, in terms of how we approached evaluating the pilot program, uh, it was primarily qualitative feedback uh, by conversations with the vendors, uh, food truck patrons, which are comprised of uh, residents, employees, and visitors in town. Um, overall, people indicated that they really appreciate having more uh, dining options that are otherwise not available in the areas that the food trucks are present, uh, which is one of the stated goals of the program from the outset. Um, many of those same people also commented that the trucks uh, seem to add to the vitality of the areas they serve. Uh, while well, others uh, took it a step further and uh, indicated that the trucks enhanced the image of, of Brookline as, as seemingly being more cutting edge and keeping up with, with trends that are very popular uh, in, in urban areas. Um, as far as being cost effective in terms of staff administration here at Town Hall, I took a look at how we admi were administering the program on a day-to-day -day basis, and it seemed to me uh, not to make sense to have two uh, departments involved in the collection of the monthly rent fees, and so if approved, um, the next, if the next iteration of the program is approved, uh, planning will assume the role of collecting the monthly rent fees. Uh, I think it'll be easier for all parties involved. Um, as far as the program being a nuisance, uh, both during the pilot program, uh, the first segment, and then following the extension in October, um, negative feedback um, from residents. Uh, brick and mortar establishments has been minimal. Uh, there's two complaints we heard uh, of note, um, both of them coming from the Com Ave uh, section of town. A couple of food establishment, establishments have indicated that they've seen a decline uh, in sales, but it's unclear if that's solely attributable to the presence of food trucks at the St. Mary's location, which is about uh, a block, block and a half or so uh, from, the, from the establishments. Um, Following notice of tonight's meeting, a couple of residents called for clarification on the scheduling, but um, not so much complaints, it's just simple house cleaning. Um, so overall, uh, I think the program's been a success, and I think if we continue to administer it in a, in a manner that's not detrimental to the brick and mortar establishments or the, or the community at large, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't continue. Questions? Yes, Selectman Daly. Yeah, um, I, I thought I saw in the in the uh, material we were supplied tonight one complaint um, from a restaurant in the St. Mary's area. But are you saying there's there's more several establishments were complaining? Uh, just two complaints. Uh, so the letter that you received is it that the Nud Pub from Mr. Yes. Chen, yeah. who was present at the extension meeting, uh, I think on an unrelated matter, um, he sent a, le a letter to Kara Bruton, um, making his case for. Uh, food trucks being detrimental to his business with their presence in St. Mary's. Uh, the other complaint, I actually went out and uh, I guess you could say I, I solicited it. Uh, I went and saw, visited Espresso Royale, which is the food establishment um, adjacent to Nud Pub. I went out to get their thoughts uh, because they hadn't reached out to us um, on the food trucks and they indicated that they've seen a decline, but again, uh, weren't able to say for sure if it was because of the food presence of the food trucks. Um, haven't seen any hard data, um, so it's really unclear. Um, I should add that at that particular location, um, there are a number of other variables at play uh, besides the food trucks. Um, BU is in the midst of renovating several buildings along an uh, inbound stretch of Com Ave, um, stretch stemming from um, 
just past the VU Bridge, uh, where Cecilia's Pizza used to be. That building is now vacant, uh, going all the way down to uh, right next to uh, Nud Pub and Espresso Royale, where VU formerly had a uh, fairly sizable classroom building, um, which is now vacant. Uh, conversations with our liaison in the Government Affairs Office at VU, I asked them if they've heard anything from the business community, and they haven't. Um, but they said that they would keep their, their ear to the ground. Um, and they also weren't able to offer any, any details on what, what's going to become of those vacant buildings either. Um, so there's a, a lot of variables at play there. Um, and there's Boston's program on the other side of Com Ave. They have food trucks there too. So, Okay. And I just would like, since we're talking about, uh, let's say, folks who have concerns about the food trucks, we did receive a letter from uh, Robert Basili, who um, is a town meeting member in Precinct 14, in general opposed to food trucks on the basis that they do not pay their fair share compared to uh, brick and mortar restaurants. So I don't know if you've seen this, but we can give you a copy for the ref for your reference. Was that at, at, during the fall uh, consideration I, for extending? I, I don't know. It's dated uh, the 23rd of April, so it must be something current to just to okay. do with the license renewals. Sure. Um, we, we did hear from Mr. Basili before, so this isn't the first time he's gone right. on record in his uh, with his opposition and concerns. Yes, Selectman Goldstein. Thanks. Um, can I ask, you, you mentioned that uh, the, one of the complaints came in unsolicited, and you said the other was sort of solicited by you. but. In general terms, did, did we make any effort to outreach to brick and mortar establishments to, to get their input, or w were we solely, other than your own initiative, were we dependent on them, them uh, reaching out to us? A uh, notice of tonight's hearing was sent to uh, abutters of the proposed locations within 300 feet, uh, so they would have received notice in the mail. Uh, we noticed town meeting members uh, via email in all relevant precincts. Um, we didn't do any kind of a follow-up questionnaire at the end of the season last year. We didn't year. do any type of formal survey, um, like a Google survey or anything like that, um, just because with it being a pilot program, it, it's hard to assign, I think, um, quantitative statistics to something that's so qualitative. Um, and I, I'm not, I'm, I don't think that the, tr the brick and mortar establishments would necessarily open their books to us to say, that, you know, this is how much money I lost because of it's we didn't do any formal survey. Uh, I, I will note that it's only at that location, the St. Mary's and Com Ave, that we have uh, food truck on the proposed schedule, lunch and dinner Monday through Friday every day, whereas all the other locations, there there's only a food truck very occasionally. Right. Well, I, I mean, I'll add that the locations for the food trucks were, were designed to be very far from the brick and mortar establishments and probably serving populations who wouldn't otherwise be frequenting our brick and mortar establishments. So um, that, that was the, my main reason for, for approving that, approving this th last year and, uh, and I, we're not changing that this year. So. No, we, we felt that the current locations or, or the previously approved locations, I should say, um, were, were striking an appropriate balance between not being detrimental to our brick and mortar establishments or the, or the surrounding neighborhoods, uh, but also enabling the trucks to um, make a go of things business-wise. They are viable locations for the trucks and, and also uh, giving them a chance to achieve the goals of the program that we set out for them. Selectman Benka. So I, I guess my question is if, if we accept the premise that we don't want to harm brick and mortar establishments, what sort of proof do you require? that there would be harm to brick and mortar establishments before we'd say, um, look, uh, we're not gonna have food trucks uh, in this location or that location. I, I think that's something that we would have to talk about. Um, and I think it's a point that we haven't gotten to yet because of our intentional location of the food trucks away from our primary commercial areas. Except I, I would also add that there have been several public meetings where the, um, community was invited and the concerns that were mentioned were more generic than specific. Right. Well, but, but we do have two locations near the Commonwealth and St. Mary's food truck location, which is, as 
Selectman Daly noted, the most intensively uh, populated by food trucks. And both of those brick and mortar establishments have said that there's some effect. There. And your response has been, well, we don't know what the cause is. I mean, I'm just wondering what, what the burden of proof is on a brick and mortar establishment to, um, you know, do they, do they, if they open their books, would we then say, okay, that's enough? I think it's something that we'd have to, to take a, a harder look at if we've received enough complaints or if we wanted to, to pursue that avenue, we'd have to establish some sort of criteria for saying we would you know, limit the amount of shifts that are, are at that location or the number of trucks. Um, I, I, I don't, we'd have to think about the criteria and we just haven't gotten to that point because again- I, mean, I, I, I think it's not a trivial question really. Oh, yeah, I, 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 I don't-, I don't I'm going to ask because the one place you mentioned sounded like a coffee shop. Was they do uh, coffee and bagels and sandwiches. Uh, I used to eat there as a grad student um, prior to the food truck program. Because uh, we only have a food truck at that location one day of the week for breakfast, which I um, imagine is a big well, time for I them. I maybe, I thought right? we we're have talking, oh, on Thursday morning, but then we have the the lunch, the lunch and there is, is yes. really heavily, heavily populated yeah. at but that location. The St. Mary's location is the most desirable amongst the vendors because of the foot traffic generated by BU. Yeah. Just to, I, I uh, have been thinking about it though as I see these food trucks around town and thinking about it because we have raised these issues and you know I, I feel that when I want to sit down at a restaurant this would not be what I'd patronize. I'd go in and sit down, and this is sort of uh, more like an alternative to grabbing a bag of chips. You know, it's not something you're kind of it, it getting on the go. So I'm not, I'm not totally convinced that um, you go, you, you. It's either sit down at a restaurant or grab something in a food truck as, as a either or. I, I think maybe they're slightly different animals. And to Selectman Banka's question, uh, in my conversations with Espresso Royale, they indicated that beverage sales, coffee, their coffee shop um, are the same, and their food sales are down. So they do bagels and sandwiches. Um, to what extent that's attributed to the to the food trucks, I don't discount the complaint, but it's it's unclear. How, how far are they? How, how far are they actually from yeah. where the food trucks are located? About a block. So there's the, the, the CBS, I believe, and then a Radio Shack. Yeah. Then you have Special Royale and Nud Pub, and then a BU class building that's vacant. Right. Other questions yeah, before the, we? The, the other question is the new location at um, Harvard and Auburn. Any restaurants, any brick and mortar restaurants within a block or two of that? No, it's. Um, I talked to transportation specific, the transportation division specifically about where the truck would go and uh, a location there for two meter spaces on Harvard Street was approved last year. Um, it's in front of the brick building that's sort of on stilts. Mm -hmm. They have a little bit of parking in front. It's opposite stop and shop. Correct. If you want to locate right, it. Right. So right. in between Coolidge and, and Brookline Village. Right. Unless you're looking for kibble. Yeah. I, I, let me just say, I, I do have some concerns about the impact on brick and mortar, and, and I, I, uh, uh, I don't know how we monitor or tease out the impact, uh, but um, to say, well, the, the brick and mortar establishment says that there's an impact, but we don't know what it is, right? Um, really. I think effectively dismisses that concern of the brick and mortar restaurant. So um, I don't know how, uh, whether there's any way to um, really determine whether there has been an impact, and if there has been an impact, what the what the solution is, whether <laughs> yeah, whether it's charging higher fees for the food trucks and providing some of that money to the brick and mortar restaurants. Uh, you know, if if they're losing business, do you? Do you subsidize, uh, or um, do you uh, restrict the locations of the food trucks so that they don't impact? Because Mr. Basili is right; they are—they're not paying taxes. Uh, they're not paying 
unless they're headquartered in Brookline, they're not paying uh, the food charge or the food tax to the, to the town. Um, they're not paying rent. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're essentially uh, um, doing business at a much lower cost and with much less direct benefit to the town and, and the town's tax base than brick and mortar are. Is the only reason we have food uh, establishments to benefit the town's tax base? No, I, you know, obviously they, they um, you know, this is providing a huge service to BU students, I think, uh, in this Well, in we, this we also had uh, one of the uh, food truck owners has now decided to have a brick yes, and mortar right. establishment. It's brick and mortar in Brookline Village. Brookline right. Village. No, so it may great. be that, you know, this is an, an entree into the business. I, I think a, a more significant works. question you <laughs> might ask if you really want to talk about the value of these is where they house their trucks. And only one is currently based in Brookline. If they were physically based in Brookline, I don't even think there'd be such a big difference. Well, that in that case, we would be getting the food tax. Yep, that's right. I think that some of the truck, uh, and maybe some of the vendors can correct me if I'm wrong, some of the trucks also do source some of their materials from Brookline businesses. I believe Compliments purchases their bread from, from Clearfowl or Bakery. So there's some, some cross-pollination happening, even if they're not. Are, are we doing this until December of? 14th. Third, so we're doing this for a year and a half? The intention behind that is to uh, align the licensing with the rest of the food establishments in town. So it's an administrative uh, move on, on our part to, to help the health department. Keep is there a significant problem if we were only to do this until the end of 13? Not really, but um, we'd prefer to stretch it out I, I guess so I we would wouldn't argue have to do another RFP uh, so quickly. That if you really want to get a measurement, you really ought to let it have enough time to have at least a significant amount of history. If, if what we hear about the um, uh, folks who may have been impacted on Commonwealth Avenue in Boston was because the students who used to frequent the building that is under construction are no longer there, then we would have enough time to get it finished and possibly repopulated, and you might see a difference. So it's not clear to me that that is such a one-to-one -one relationship. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, we, we do have sort of an information gap here. Uh, well, I, I, I mean, I think if the, if the burden on the brick and mortars that were affected was really significant, I think we'd be hearing about this in a different way. So I'm gauging it partially by the fact that we don't have these people here. We haven't received letters about uh, we it. Do we do have. We do. Right. Well, then let's hear. Let's, by all means. Sure. Uh, we'll be d willing to take some comments. Come forward. Identify yourself. Uh, my name is Larry Margulies. I'm a resident of Brookline. I'm also the owner of Espresso Royale Cafe. 736 Tom Ave. I also have uh, four other locations in Boston. So I heard you guys are having this meeting and I appreciate taking the time to hear me. Um, we have seen a decrease in our sales uh, in the last year and we do attribute it to the food trucks between certain hours. Uh, between 11 a.m. <coughs> and 3 p.m. Our sales are off between 4 and 8 percent. And um, it's hard to say, okay, I didn't know that, uh, you know, the, the building down the street was um, vacant for the classrooms, but uh, it was my understanding that this program was for, um, sorry, I'm a little flustered speaking in public, um, okay. to bring business to underserved areas of the city. So the corner of Comav and um, St. Mary's, very busy corner, there's a lot of restaurants there, and we have definitely seen an impact. So if you guys want to see my books, I'm happy to show it to you, but uh, I just wanted to get my two cents. Good. Can, can, you, can you, so you said we 
between four and eight percent. Yeah. And oh, the food sales. And and does the time that you said it coincide with the time that the food trucks are down? Are, are there? So is it four? Yeah. And so it's been over the last year. Between four to eight percent. Are you able to measure the hours on during which you're down four to eight percent? Is what I'm asking. If I did a, a detailed analysis of my books, which I haven't, yeah. but do I have the capacity to do that? Yes. Yeah. Um, this has only been going on for about a year. All my other stores have seen sales go up uh, 2%, 3%, upwards of my store on Gainsborough Street, up to 13% sales are up this year. My sales at my BU store are down collectively about 2%. Um, but between these hours, we are definitely seeing an impact. So these trucks are about 300 feet from my front door. Um, and when you guys are talking about tax revenues, I am kind of shocked that somebody is selling food in Brookline and you guys aren't collecting meals taxes. I mean, I'm paying it's Because of the states, the way the state has um, permitted the food trucks, the meals tax goes with the place where the okay. truck is housed. I, I understand that, that concept. So if I say between... Uh, 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. I do a thousand dollars in food sales. You know the state and Massachusetts and Brookline get seven percent, so that's seventy bucks. So whatever money and okay, so that's you know you guys get three percent or whatever two and a half percent. So whatever money I'm losing because it's going to food truck, the city of Brookline is losing money. Actually, you're in Boston, I think. No, so, uh, no, nope, you're Royale in, Brooklyn? in Brookline. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, I know this isn't all about taxes, okay? It's about creating a vibrant community, and that's why I like living in Brookline. Um, I think it's great. But the, re the purpose of the food truck program, one of the purposes is to serve underutilized areas and give options to people to eat. Now, at St. Mary's and Comab, there is no lack of places to eat. So, and they said, okay, well, Clover is opening up a brick and mortar. This is a gateway to uh, a brick and mortar store. I would love to know what their feeling would be is if, you know, I just drove up a truck 300 from their, feet from their front door and started taking some of their business. You know, I pay uh, meals taxes, but I also pay the real estate taxes every month. Uh, so, and about $12,000 to be you in rent. So um, it's definitely having an impact on us. I'm not against food trucks. I just don't think that at that intersection uh, they're needed. But you did say were you, you were not aware that this building was yeah, in was construction a, right. down the street. So, so you can't actually say, oh, maybe a certain percentage is off because of that building being unoccupied and a certain percentage to the food truck. You no. No, You're I, not really aware. I can't, you know, I can't also control the weather. You know, it's right. a lot more this winter than it did last year. Yeah. But all I can say is, since food trucks started, my business is down. Okay. So. I've, got a, I've got a question, I think, for Andy then. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So I would say to Selectman Banka's point about wanting some data, it would be interesting if there were no food truck there one day of the week, and then we could see um, what the real effect is. If, if his business went up on the day of the week that there was no food truck in, around, then we would know, yeah, it really is having an impact and kind of get a sense of what that impact was. No, I, th I think it's a, a, a interesting point. I'm glad you mentioned it. Um, another, another consideration uh, for the pilot program is that the vendors have actually had limited operations for the past few months as well at the St. Mary's location due to uh, ongoing and extensive construction on St. Mary Street. Um, I know that I began or was scheduled to begin sometime in late December, early January, uh, but due to weather and, and other um, uh, project concerns, I understand from DPW, it ended up being a more invasive project than they initially thought, longer timeline than they initially thought, and so the food trucks so that might have been impacting his business as well if, if there was construction. There's the potential for that. Um, 
but to Dick's point, I don't think that we have enough data points yet to say that, yes, yeah. this many trucks at St. Mary's is detrimental. So what you're telling us, though, is there's going to be more trucks there than he, what he's experienced already because now that the construction's over or something, we're putting them in there every single day, lunch and dinner. It would be more for the dinner shift uh, than the lunch shift. Right now there's two trucks there Monday through Friday if they're able to operate during the lunch hours. For dinner, they, they're not there as much because we don't have as many vendors. With the proposal, it would be two, just, I think, two trucks, except for Thursdays and Fridays. Or no, your proposal here. It's Monday. No, Mondays and Tuesdays. I'm sorry. It's Monday through Friday. Yeah. But for the dinner, dinner shift. Yeah. I mean, Just one, specifically. It's, it's an interesting concept. One way to design an experiment would be to uh, close it off one day of the week and um, and. Uh, well, we could temporarily do it for a couple of days during the week, Tuesdays and Thursdays or something, and just for a couple of months and see how that see how that goes. I mean, if, if, uh, Espresso Royale would be willing to open their books and we could see if those days are different uh, than the other days. I mean, I, I just, um, I guess I, I take the impact on, the potential impact on brick and mortar restaurants very seriously. And uh, uh, is there some way to determine whether there is or there isn't, or it just brings synergy to an area and attracts people and you know, they come and buy a taco and then go and get a, uh, a cup of coffee, and who knows? I, I just don't know. But um, should we see if there's anyone else who wants to speak sure. on the issue? Is there anyone else who would like to comment on the food trucks licensing? Okay, let's see. If you just come over to the side here and line up, um, we'll be glad to hear from you. Identify yourself for the record. Hello, my name is Brian Pugh. I'm with the Baja Taco Truck, and I am at St. Mary's and Calm Ave. First, I'd like to thank you, um, because it allowed me to start a new business and get things going, employ people in the community that otherwise weren't, weren't employed. Part of the benefits that I don't think has been talked about, I'm currently employing three people from Brookline. They didn't have jobs before I opened, and they'd been looking for jobs for a while. So that's three people now working you know, 30, 40 dollars, 40, 30 to 40 hours a week that didn't have jobs before. I don't know how that tailors into the tax base for Brookline, if at all. But certainly they're spending more money in the town as a result than they were before. We um, buy our propane at Brookline Ice, which I think that's in Brookline. Maybe just a name. But yeah. so every week we're spending, gosh, $150, $200 a week on propane um, in Brookline as well. And often my staff actually buy coffee, right, at the local coffee shop right next door. So now they have some more buyers. Um, buying um, coffee from them as well. So there is a trickle down effect. My business plan is not to be in a truck forever. It's to open up shops and it's really a test and to build a clientele in certain areas around town and then look for real estate and um, open little taco shops. I've modeled my business very much after San Diego taco shops and want to bring that to the Boston and New England area. So potentially I could be employing a lot more people and paying real estate tax and everything else in the town of Brookline down the line. But um, I couldn't possibly afford right off the bat to open a restaurant in my first step. I was lucky to have the money to open a truck. And that's why I'm so thankful for this program because it allows me to start a new business, employ people, um, help stimulate the economy out there. So I think there's more effects here than people might realize paying food trucks. And we built up a really cool following there and a lot of people are very appreciative. People are pulling up and from all over town and um, buying tacos from us because we provide a food that's very, very different from anything else in the Brookline area. And that's one of the things you really got to respect about the Brookline program is they worked really hard to protect the restaurants. And they were very clear that you couldn't be close to like-minded restaurants or like food um, out there. And they really did try and protect you, try to really protect the um, the existing restaurants and not allow that. One of the complaints or concerns that you heard tonight was I think the noodle store, if I remember that correctly. And they are, gosh, made a quarter mile down the street on Calm Ave. It's not Brookline that's causing the problem for them. It's Boston. They parked two Asian 
inspired trucks right across the street from the noodle store. So Brookline's not caused the problem for that store at all. And those are two of the most popular trucks in the Boston area. So you have two incredibly popular trucks parking right across the street from a similar themed restaurant that you had absolutely nothing to do with putting those there. That's Boston that put those there. So that um, might help put that a little bit in perspective um, for what, um, what effect it's having on that establishment. And maybe the letter is better written to Boston because Boston's also very sensitive to those issues and doesn't want like-minded trucks close to brick and mortar of the same kind. Yeah, at least of the brick and mortar in Boston. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know exactly where the line goes for there, so I can't comment on that. I apologize. But um, like I said, thank you. Do, you. do you have any questions of me? or? No, but thank you very much for coming forward. Appreciate thank you. it. Have a good evening. Davidson, I'm a Brookline resident, Precinct 13, Kilsyth Road. Uh, I frequent uh, Compliments Food Truck outside of 1842 Beacon. Um, it's been really great uh, to have them in the neighborhood. Uh, above all, they're good neighbors. Um, they moved, if I'm not mistaken, Kimmy, Bobby, you guys used to live in Quincy, now you live in Brighton, in the neighborhood of where they where they have the truck. Granted, they don't they don't live in Brookline and they don't park their truck in Brookline, but they're essentially neighbors and they're good neighbors. Uh, I know there was concerns when the program was brought up. The folks on John Street didn't want it because they're afraid there'd be a lot of trash. Um, that's, that's not happening. <laughs> um, they make good food. Uh, they're always happy to see all their customers. Um, they really bring a lot of positive energy to the neighborhood and um, I'm really glad they're there, and I hope they, they stay. Um, I do think just listening to some of the comments tonight about the 11 St. Mary Street um, location, that if that were to be eliminated, that would kill the current mobile food vendor program. Um, if for some reason down the line you decide because of the effects on bricks and mortar, such as Espresso Royal Cafe, that that uh, location should be changed, there really needs to be a look at other potential sites um, or it will kill the program because a number of these vendors do work in other towns uh, because they're not getting, you know, they're not getting five days a week in Brookline. Um, and food trucks is just as competitive as restaurants. Um, they need to make a living. So um, I at least advise the board to consider or the program to consider other potential locations for food trucks in the future, maybe communities that aren't being, um, you know, uh, adequately, uh, I don't know, considered. I don't know what to say about that. I'd also invite you to go to a food truck if you haven't already. Uh, I went to compliments on Sunday night and Jesse Mermel showed up right behind me as we were leaving. Um, as my understanding, she was a proponent of the, uh, the program. Uh, and that if you haven't gone, um, particularly anyone who lives in Precinct 13, I don't know if any of you do, um, it would be a good idea to come to compliments and meet Kimmy and Bobby and understand how much it means to them to be in Brookline. Thanks. Thank you. The, the, if I could just comment, the, the Beacon and Englewood um, location really I think is not an issue here. Because no, what I'm saying is that in order to keep the food trucks, all of the businesses in Brookline, even at the 1842 location, it would have to be made worthwhile for them um, or they're just going to go away. I mean, uh, C Cleveland Circle has food trucks um, on weekends uh, right near the ball field. Um, and some very popular ones too. I, I don't know what Boston does. I'm surprised that, uh, I would be surprised if the vendors in Cleveland Circle haven't complained to Boston about it uh, because those are all takeout food vendors. Um, and so are the trucks. Um, but as far as I know, it's, it's adding to the neighborhood and it's fairly vibrant. So thanks. Thank you. <coughs> Good evening. Uh, Harry Robinson, Executive Director of Brookline Chamber of Commerce. And I remember over a year ago being quite involved in, in the discussions and, and working with uh, the chamber and uh, businesses uh, brick and mortar and, and actually being quite torn 
because some of the feedback we got, or a lot of the feedback we got was mixed. It wasn't predictably against food trucks. In some cases, some brick and mortars, one brick and mortar in particular who houses their truck in Brookline um, also has, well, brick and mortar has a truck and it's been a pretty, pretty good uh, experience for them both on both sides of the equation. So we appreciated, significantly appreciated limiting uh, the, the specific locations where they were serving underserved as opposed to close to brick and mortars because I had lots of anecdotal discussions before and after the program went into effect. Um, again, mixed, but later coming in against. But really since the program's been in effect, not really much has come uh, our direction negative. I will say that um, definitely in seeing in the report of extending out to 2014, I certainly am not interested in the chambers, I'm interested in increasing the administrative burden, but would be very interested in, in still, I really like the, the comfort of the, the zone of staying uh, 2000, end of 2013 as we did on the, in last year's program having a fairly short duration so we could go back and look at it to see if there's any change. And there will be a change with the truck in the kind of in between Coolidge Corner and Brookline Village, even though there's really nothing right there that is a bit of a change, bringing it closer to uh, Coolidge Corner, which is obviously a dense uh, concentration of brick and mortar. So I still think there's some unknowns. Um, getting to the, some of the points brought up by the board um, about real effect. So that's why I, I would say I strongly consider, instead of going out to the end of 2014, the end of 2013, again, not trying to bring any strong administrative issues, again, allowing for uh, some data or some research. And uh, Andy, I'd be happy to work with you a little bit closer or, or kind of in bring in some of, the, some of the people to do some more, uh, help out with research on that. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your offer. Hi, uh, my name's Allie Hyatt, and to be honest, I'm not sure which precinct I live in, but I'm a Brookline <laughs> resident. It's okay. Well, uh, you could give us a general a street, will, a, yeah, street number. Yeah, yeah and so figure it, it out. It has to do with the reason. That, so I, I live on Auburn Court, which is where, um, one of the food trucks. The new, new location. The new one. Right. And Seven, I, I believe. Yep. And I actually came <laughs> specifically because I'm highly in support of it, and I really appreciated what you had to say, Brian, and I mean, what everyone had to say. You know, I understand your point of view, you know, especially Royale as well. Um, but as a person, you know, who recently moved to Brookline from Boston, and I, I don't want to repeat some of the stuff other people have said, I think it's something that's a huge service to the community, and it's something food trucks really do have this passionate following behind them. And for me, if I go to a food truck, and I know the same is true of, of friends as well, it's not necessarily a choosing between one or the other. And I'd actually, Andy, be happy to help you on the other side in um, having a, a business background and understanding what are the sort of positive impacts of that. Um, and I just want to share one anecdote that I saw on the Clover website yesterday, which was um, someone who works for Clover was I guess setting up the store there and you know starting to put up signs, and all these people from the community came by and um, were helping her put it up because they were so excited to see that there. So I just wanted to kind of share that that there's sort of a lot of positivity and um, growth that it brings to Brookline as well, especially as um, you know younger couples and, and families move into Brookline and, and want it to be a positive place. So thank you. Okay, and thank you for your offer of assistance. Sure. <laughs> Robert McLean, uh, me and my girlfriend own Compliments Food Truck. Um, we thank you for the program. It's been fantastic. We've had a lot of great feedback. Um, we buy our bread from Clear Flower Bakery in Brookline. We also buy everything from uh, Brookline Ice and Cold, like Brian. Also, we employ a Brookline High School graduate. Um, it's our sole employee right now, and we plan on employing more. Um, referring back to Espresso Royale's comment, um, on Gainsborough Street, we also have a Boston license to vent. Um, there is a food truck spot probably a block or two from his Espresso Royale, which hasn't lost any business. 
So I'm just thinking about the St. Mary Street where he's lost business there and there's many other factors. Um, but he hasn't lost business in other locations where there's food trucks adjacent. But it, Helpful qu point. Question for you. Uh, yeah. So the suggestion was made that if if St. Mary's didn't exist as a location that you wouldn't be able to really continue functioning in Brookline. Is, it, is that accurate? For most of the trucks are parked on St. Mary Street. Yes, we actually have our first chance to do St. Mary Street uh, this upcoming season. Mm -hmm. So, but if it wasn't for, I mean, you weren't on at, at St. Mary's last year. Right? No, we weren't. And but there was enough business at Englewood that you yeah, and our and our Pleasant Street spot where we, you know, barely survived. Um, but the St. Mary's is the core of the Brookline program. That's where all the students are. That's where, you know, two trucks are lined up daily. Um, and that's, and, you know, that's the core of the program. Okay. Okay. Right. Second daily? Yeah, yeah. I, I realize you can't speak for any other food truck owners, but do you sell coffee, for instance? No. So might there be an opportunity for him to, you know, have a card, like if they buy their sandwich from you and here's a discount card, go down and get a coffee from him? Is that something you might consider? Oh, um, as, as the last speaker said something about the synergy of um, we uh, we love our coffee every time we find a new food truck spot we're you know going to the coffee shop that's right there but I was speaking more about for the customers if you might have um, some kind of thing where you'd say yeah I'll give out your cards that they can get a discounted <coughs> coffee you know so they get their sandwich from me and I I'll give you the coffee. card, and yeah. you can go Very down and get, yeah. you know, something from him or something like that. Is that something you'd consider? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I actually, uh, excuse me. Would you you said you barely survived on Pleasant Street? Is that right? Um, more Beacon Street. It really took a few months to build the following yeah. of um, Bill, and now we have a you know few hundred people right. that we uh, serve. Okay. I, um, we offered some different locations that I gather no one was interested in. And I think, and actually I can ask this to everybody, but I think it might be interesting if in the next couple of months people might consider recommending a location, bearing in mind what the town's criteria are. Uh, maybe we've overlooked something that might be a good location that also would not be um, in competition. I, I don't know the answer to that, but it seems to me this is one where we might be able to uh, work together in some way. So, Yeah, anything to do ex to expand the program, make it better for, yeah. for all of us. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I, I have maybe another couple of questions for Andy. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, I am a little bit concerned about the intensity. At, I realize they like the St. Mary Street, but it does make it tough for um, the, the bricks and mortar people nearby uh, to have two of them there almost every day at lunch and and uh, three three of the dinners too and two other nights just one um, so I am a little concerned about that kind of intensity at that one location but the other thing is like I, I wondered if you'd thought about um, um, having one at the high school maybe at lunchtime uh. My understanding of the regs, they prohibit that. I, I think, oh, yeah, they you're right. They're not allowed. There's a lot of people there. Well, I think, that it, it, as you said, or someone from the board said, there are a lot of unknowns, and I think if we were to enable the program to have uh, a, a good opportunity to, now that the trucks are, some of the trucks are established in town, and it, the word is out that Brookline has food trucks, and that some of them are creating a following. Um, I think it's an opportunity with this next phase to test the program. And so if we add more vendors, what does that do to the vitality of our commercial areas and neighborhoods? And how does that impact our brick and mortar establishments? And then how do we evaluate that? And I think that's an appropriate way to go about things. I think the pilot program, there are a lot of even more unknowns. And that's why it was a pilot program. Um, and so far, the program has proven to have more benefits judging from the feedback you've heard here tonight and the conversations that we've had with vendors, residents, employees in town. And so I think we need more of a chance to, to gather data on the program now that it's established. 
But, but am I correct that the intensity of our licensed food trucks at St. Mary's is you're proposing that it increase over what it currently is? The way the RFP was written, the trucks prioritized the locations that they'd want to be at. Uh, just about all the trucks, if not all the trucks, indicated they wanted to be at St. Mary's at least once per week. Um, and so in evaluating the applications, that's how we, we chose the locations. It wasn't, that, that was, that's the methodology for, for locating where they are. Do you have any idea how many of these food trucks sell coffee or tea? I don't think. I don't think any of them do. Typically, they were just uh, cold cold drinks. That's what I remember from reviewing so the menus. If we, could, if we could prohibit the sale of coffee and tea at these food trucks at, at, at St. Mary's, we got a very narrow problem here. Well, he's complaining. I'm about not his, sure that the food, food, food trucks sales. have caused the mm -hmm. sales loss. So I think it'd be very premature to decide to micromanage. If they want to collaborate and support one another in marketing and identify where a source of coffee is, sure, go for it. But it's not clear to me it's our job to do that. I mean, it just seems to me that a coffee is, you know, an espresso coffee bar is a very different establishment than, yeah. a, than a taco right. bar. Somebody seeking one doesn't necessarily want the other. I think he specifically said his food sales were off, though. He's not saying his coffee sales are off. I would recommend just a, uh, I know administratively it's more difficult, but uh, you know, if we are to extend this, it, I, I don't think we should be going to December 2014 at this point. I think that we should also ask for a, a, a more extensive outreach at the end of the program too, to, to solicit response from brick and mortar establishments and uh, you know, invite a more more detailed evaluation of, of, of what the impact is. But I, th I think it's pretty, I, I thought it was a very pertinent comment that if Boston food trucks directly competing with one of these restaurants are right across the street, um, that that's certainly not uh, the fault of our food trucks if, if somebody's business is going on. So I mean, I think you have to look at those factors too. And perhaps we could ask Boston to yeah, well, not have the direct competing uh, food trucks. I mean, for example, I noticed that like on Friday, we've only got one food truck set up at lunchtime. So that reality should reflect itself in the in the brick and mortar business, where the rest of the time there's two food trucks and one day there's one. We, we should be able to see some difference on Friday. So, I mean, I, I want to give them the chance to make their case. Then why don't we only propose that the um, licensing be extended through December 2013 and not try on the fly to design a research project that really needs, I think, to have Andy and uh, Alan think about and come back to us, okay? Um, I'm actually going to ask, uh, would you just help us by identifying who the new I believe there are four new ones. Lobster Love, that's a good idea. Sure. Um, the new vendors are Beantown Taco, Lobster Love, Grilled Cheese Nation, Clover Food, um, and Blue Zone is not new to the program. They've just partnered with someone. Uh, it was formerly Renewal's Greek Kitchen. It's still exactly the same product offering from what I understand. Mm -hmm. It's just a new name, new brand. And unless I'm mistaken, Grilled Cheese and Lobster Love are the same ownership under the same ownership yep uh, food truck nation is the company and he operates lobster love and grilled cheese Got nation it. i believe he has okay. four trucks right. that he rotates through so do we have any more questions before we're ready to uh, take a vote have the parking tickets for compliments been taken care of it was brought to my attention today and i have not had a chance to talk to kim and bobby about it but I believe they have every intention of, of settling their affairs. Well, we can um, move these based on um, any conditions that have been provided by e either the health department or the police department or the uh, fire department, if, if there are any conditions. Right. 
so that that would be withheld until those tickets are paid. Settled. And Wait a minute. Are they getting tickets for so violating the two-hour rule? I, I heard about it at three o'clock this afternoon, and I haven't had a chance to talk. It's, there's sort of a disconnect here. Yeah, right. We're licensing in the, to be there from three to eleven. It may be the owner. It's the applicant, uh, probably doing business as. Um, if you look at on the very bottom of the April twenty-second memo, which is uh, the second or the third page of the packet number ten, it's this. Yeah, right. I, I read it and now I've lost it. <laughs> Sorry, Dick, what, what, what page is it? Ten? Um, it doesn't have a number. No number on it? Could be. We don't know. Parking tickets, unpaid. That's all I can tell you. You have to come to the microphone. You have to come to the microphone if you want to respond. This, are these business parking tickets or are personal? That's what we're asking we you. Uh, we have a few parking tickets on our my girlfriend's car that she owns uh -huh. that I don't think has anything to do with registered or anything in Brooklyn except for getting these parking tickets there. Okay. Well, I, 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 the issue here is that our police department is um, pr setting a condition on issuing a license to an applicant who has outstanding parking tickets. Okay. It's the applicant, okay. not the truck, not the food truck. All right, I understand. Okay. Thanks. We can definitely sure. pay those off. Okay. Also. I think I think that would be wise. Yes. All right. Okay. Hi there. Uh, my name is Tom Geiger. I live on Auburn Street, <coughs> and I'm I'm coming here tonight not knowing really what to expect. Um, my main concern after reading it, uh, reading the letter was that uh, there may be a problem with parking. We have so little parking on Auburn Street to begin with. But um, after hearing This will be parked on Harvard Street. Yes, but it's right around the corner, as I understand it, uh, from Auburn Street. Yes, it is. And so my only, uh, it's a quick comment, and that is I hope that you will perhaps uh, make it uh, go till the end of 2013, uh, which would give uh, everyone a chance to, to try it out and see what it's like. It may be good. I just don't know. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. All right. Are we ready to take a vote? Yeah, I, um, let me just say I, I would not have supported this until the end of 14. Going to the end of 13 um, is uh, uh, perhaps an opportunity to determine the impact. I am not sure how you're going to do that uh, unless we were to restrict, um, you know, basically to shut down that location for a day a week or two days a week. Um, and maybe it at a next go round, you're going to recommend that as as a way to determine the impact on bricks and mortar. All right, you're going to make some kind of condition, or are we going to vote this? Well, um, you're I think you're not. Well, I think his motion is just that we. I, I heard that part, but I also heard a lot more, and I would like clarity. No, no, I I think um, I think we're. The, the motion would be to extend it until uh, the end of uh, 2013 yep. rather than 2014. Mm -hmm. But I, th I think we are asking you, not as part of this motion, but asking you um, in your capacity and um, to um, figure out a way to see what this impact is and, and um, so you can report back to us before we're asked to renew this again. It may be it may be an undoable assignment unless uh, unless we were to um, to set up a test um, by uh, closing down um, the St. Mary's Commonwealth 
location a couple of days a week and seeing what happens. Well, how about this? I, again, oppose trying to design something right. on the fly. And, I, and I do believe Mr. Martineau and Dr. Balsam have got a pretty clear idea what we're asking them. So can we move this? Well, it's 10 o'clock. I also think the brick and mortar establishments uh, themselves bear some responsibility of proving the case. Yep. You know, yeah. But you, sh you should, I think uh, Selectman uh, Goldstein is right. You know, for instance, you have only one food truck there um, on Friday instead of two, and two of the late, you know, the evening shifts, you only have one instead of two. So you may be able to determine some difference um, from those days, you know. Could, could we let them figure that out? Right. right. Yeah. I'm just I, I, I would them like them. to I, delegate I, that task. I, I, think if they I agree we're make not going to do it on the floor. I think okay. if they want to make the case, they'll be able to make it. I think right. even our, you know, our, our objector stated that he could do he could do more to prove the case. So. And, and I, I think um, it would be nice to have some sort of uh, interim kind of report back to us in September maybe um, when the food trucks have been in operation for a while and you've had a little time to think about how to perhaps assess them. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Then I'm going to move that we continue the pilot mobile food truck program and issue mobile food truck permits at the locations approved by the health and planning departments from May 1st, 2013 until December 31st, 2013. That would include Baja Taco Company, Beantown Taqueria, Blue Zone, Clover Food Incorporated, Compliments Food Truck, Fugu Foods, Grilled Cheese Nation, Lobster Love LLC, Paris Restaurant Group doing business as Paris Creperi, Penny Packer Food, and Penny Packer Food Trucks. All in. Uh, and, and just subject to the conditions of uh, building, health planning, fire, and police. So moved. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Benka? Aye. Selectman Goldstein? Aye. Chair votes aye. And Thank you. we'll look Thank forward you. to hearing back from you. Thanks aye. very much. Thanks, Andy. Okay, we now have a collection of warrant articles. Um, Ms. DeBoe, I believe you have a contract ratified? Yes, I do. Sandra DeBoe, um, Director of Human Resources. We have uh, settled our first contract um, during this new round of contracts. Um, it's the AFSME main uh, collective bargaining unit we were able to settle the contract for um, the years July, uh, FY 13, 14, and 15 with wage increases of 2% in each of these years. We also were able to get language that will allow us to increase efficiencies with regard to direct deposits and electronic advisories rather than printing a lot of checks. Um, there are some license renewals that we do on a regular basis for this union's membership. Um, and we decided to put that practice into the contract, but to put a cap on it at 250, which we think is um, more than reasonable and uh, a little bit about, it's right around what we're paying right now at this point, but there was no cap that had been established um, previously. Uh, we made a slight adjustment to the longevity pay schedule. They had some interest in, um, well, they wanted to extend all the different longevity um, uh, steps in the ladder. And uh, in the end, of, at the end of the day, we decided to give very minor steps to the lower, and uh, minor increases to the lower, and more significant ones to the employees who had been here for 20 uh, years or more. Um, perhaps the greatest uh, movement um, in efficiencies moving forward and reducing our um, future liability with regard to vacation and vacation time that's owed 
when people retire, when they carry their banks forward, um, is that for new, we, we looked at the vacation accruals that we had in the contract and we felt that they were pretty generous, um, too, too generous almost uh, compared to the private sector certainly. And so for new employees, uh, once they hit 15 years, they will get four weeks vacation and previously they would get five weeks vacation at that point. We also collapsed one of the gates uh, between five and 15 years. Once you hit five and until you're at 15, you have three weeks vacation. Previously, between five and 10 years, you had three. And then between um, 15, 10 or more to 15, you had four. And then after 15, you had five. So for new employees coming on, their uh, overall, the course of their career, once they hit 15 years, they, won't, they will get four weeks and no more than that. So um, this is something that we're bargaining with all our unions and uh, so we were, we're pretty happy that we were able to establish this with um, APSME. And this is a contract, they, they have new leadership um, we were able to finish this contract in less than a year, which is a record, uh, at least since I've been here. And they also were able to ratify it at, I believe it was 110 um, in favor of on only, only 11 opposing. So, so they did a really good job on the other side as well. So that's it. Good. Questions for Ms. DeBeau? Um, I, I know this one is ratified and before we take a vote on the warrant article, which is really what we're here yes. to do tonight, mm -hmm. uh, would you anticipate any other contracts to be uh, agreed to or ratified yes. by town meeting? I, I think so. We will get a better sense um, later, this week, actually tomorrow. Ah. We're gonna be meeting with library, and if okay. library wants to do ver something very similar to the main uh, bargaining unit, it may move very quickly. Okay. So we anticipate that that may happen and engineers seems to be motivated to um, uh, get something um, signed very quickly and ratified as well. Okay. So I anticipate there, may, there will probably be two more at this okay. point. All right, in that case, can we just hold this one until the... Yeah, we we well, actually we were, were discussing here whether we actually voted no action earlier I thought we took no vote. I thought we decided to hold yeah. it. So, I th but I think, I think, I think, I think it you makes sense to hold it. Yeah. Right. So right. we can vote it now and then yeah, um, point, reconsider. I, I we're really trying to get as much uh, moving in, in the uh, combined reports as we can. Okay. All right. All right. So you want to write it up. Then um, I move favorable action on Article 2. Did we vote? Did we vote no action earlier? I don't think we did it at all. We held it. We just held it? Okay. We held it. Thank you. Um, I move favorable action on Article 2. All in favor, please well, say. Wait a minute. I, I think you have to say on um, for the well, AFSME contract. It's, yes, I can do, we can add that, but I'm assuming that if we vote favorable action under collective bargaining, it will be whatever other contracts we approve. Well, we haven't approved any. Yeah, I, think, I don't want to vote. Uh, I don't right. want to vote to approve we've, we've, ones I haven't seen yet. No, so I, I okay. think actually in public, uh, I think we have discussed in executive session prior to uh, union ratification. So I, I do think it's appropriate for the board to All right, so reference are, are the we uh, memorandum of understanding to recommend approval of the Ask Me contract under Article Two. I, I would say the Ask Me main bargaining unit contract. Right. All right, as referenced in the April 22nd, 20, 2013 memo from Sandra DeBow. The motion is to recommend favorable action on Article 2 as it relates only to the AFSCME. Local uh, 1358. Thank you, contract, uh, and as described in the memorandum of Sandra DeBow, director dated April 22nd, 2013. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Vinka? Aye. Selectman Goldstein? Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you. Okay, the next item is the unpaid bills. Do we have any? I'm happy to report that we do not. All right, now previously we held this because we thought some might appear, but are you ready to declare 
that we should vote it? Yep. All right, then I move no action on Article 5, unpaid bills of prior years. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Benka? Aye. Selectman Goldstein? Aye. Chair votes aye. What are we going to do about the budget since no. we don't seem to have it yet? Well, um, well, we have it. The advisory committee, it oh. says here. Um. We ha what you have in front of you is uh, a memo from um, Mel from the town administrator yep. um, outlining kind of what's happened since you had your initial review of the budget. A um, couple of things. The advisory committee added an additional $500 to their food budget, and the Council on Aging was also increased by 4000 uh, $83 uh, for a part-time social worker. Um, what you have also in front of you is a prepared vote that um, incorporates these changes and um, the way that we make up the difference is by reducing the telecom budget in the IT department. So, um, Mel, if you want to add kind of... Yeah, I think what I would like to do then is, is also address the um, uh, some of the issues about the state aid, which then have some implications on, on the possible school budget, um, but uh, the House Ways and Means budget, when it came out, it, it was about $450,000 less than what we had anticipated uh, in the uh, in our financial plan. Uh, we did recommend uh, to the school committee and others to hold, you know, to, to not, uh, you know, base their, their actions on that because the, the budget process of the state is multifaceted, and in fact, Today, um, based on a number of amendments that were passed at the, at the full house, uh, our state aid looks to be uh, that that loss is at least ha only half now, or or maybe even better than that. We, so we have to look at that, and then of course the Senate will then act further. So at this point, um, you know we we are recommending that the board and the advisory committee approve the budget, um, the school budget, and the other budgets, with the exception of these two ch minor changes as we've proposed. Um, I will say that uh, in the event that the, um, the, the state aid does not materialize, uh, we believe that we'll have the flexibility to, to make the school budget whole, at least to where we were when we proposed the financial plan. Uh, and so uh, we believe that the uh, budget is, uh, is ready to be voted on uh, as proposed with the exception of those two, two issues that uh, Melissa previously identified. Okay, and, and Melissa, you're, you're uh, proposed vote starting on 11-8 or page 8-1 is written for the um, combined reports includes the two changes made by right. the advisory committee so if we vote this s language that's here those changes are already you can also reference the tables the, the changes table in the back okay in the well. okay fine I, I, yeah, I have daily? a question so is this some um, I know the town uh, moderator has said that um, in, in case Article 10 passes, which would, is uh, dealing with the Human Relations Commission, and um, that we should have a alternate budget. Um, so the one we're at being asked to vote on now does not include. Um, not at this time. We are going to mm -hmm. we are going to create a um, uh, a budget amendment in the event that. Uh, but but this this happens. this vote would assume the passage of Article 9 as recommended, the reorganization recommended by the town administrator, and th that's the budget that we would be voting tonight. Okay. So we'd well, only have an alternate vote ready at town meeting, should I, we I should it. perhaps have said um, earlier uh, when we appointed the, the committee, uh, the diversity committee, that, that I am going to move um, that both your article and the article of uh, some of the, some members other article, of the, the article, article, 10. article 10, article 9 and 10, both be referred to that committee, but I certainly have no objection to um, you moving forward with your plan and with Mr. Jelano in the uh, acting capacity or, or, or however you want to work that and um, ha still have the money be under, um, under there for the time being. Um, but let me just ask, um, should on your, your alternate proposal. Yes. Um, are you thinking that the um, that position of the, um, you, you've already indicated to us that you're going to move um, the cable access uh, monitoring to your office. Correct. And I believe some of the other tasks that uh, Steve Bressler used to do were going to be moved um, 
for example, Various contract compliance would, would move to the procurement division right. of the finance. Department. So th that would not need to be a full-time position, um, I would think, because well, let me, let me say that we're, it, in the event that, we're still evaluating things, but in the event that um, uh, the articles get, uh, both articles get referred or Article 10 fails, um, we, we are preparing budget motions that would uh, only bring back the, the amount of money that's in the budget in the health department, which is, I believe, about 40,000 40, less than it was last year. So. We, we'd still have to look at it, but whether we, you know, it's part-time or, or, or there's some other way, uh, it's not going to be the same amount. I, I think at this point we would, uh, we would look to, uh, to just transfer the money that's in the, um, in, uh, that was transferred to the health department, which is a lot, a lot less than, well, somewhat less than the, than the full budget last year. But just to be clear, what I believe um, we will be doing now is voting sufficient funds to staff the Human Relations Commission in the interim by um, the transfer that was made to Health and Human Services. Right, as well as uh, the Commission for the Disabled and the Women's Commission. Right. S the, 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 the budget currently anticipates that the responsibility for human relations Commission for the Disabled, Commission for Women, and um, some of the other uh, tasks that were specifically being handled by the Director of Human Relations Youth Resources, is, is, it is assumed that the 1.5 staff or whatever it is, 1.75, I've forgotten exactly, the, the funding that's in this budget would be sufficient. And even if the articles are referred, the staff could be funded, and I think what um, the town administrator was suggesting is that we might make a line item transfer if we had to, but it seems like it's enough money. And if it's not, we'll figure that out too. Okay. Well, My point I though was that you would continue to um, move some of the uh, auxiliary tasks to the places you've already indicated to us. Correct. And, um, so. There would be some flexibility in that. Correct. Okay. But I, I'm not trying to beat this to death, but I really feel it strongly to reassure people that we would have sufficient funding for the Human Relations Commission as in the budget that we are proposing to vote. I, I will <laughs> review with the board um, the proposed uh, 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 motions for uh, amendment of the budget, the speculative ones, but I, I, we don't have those fully developed. Goldstein. Thanks. Is the the s school budget as currently configured? Does it include the program cuts that were that were being discussed, and does it include the uh, the fees for uh, ex all day kindergarten, that, all extended kindergarten? That, that, those those are not part of the budget uh, anymore. Though, is that's that? correct. The school committee uh, voted a budget that was based on uh, on this number would would um, have reductions and. Actually, I believe they decided not to vote the um, kindergarten fees, the school but, committee. But the reality is that um, whatever happens within the school budget, town meeting does not vote. Town oh, no, I understand, but we've got to vote them some money. But I'm wondering if the money that we're voting them according to the budget right now necessitates the elimination of program or, or programs, or have they made some trimmings in other in other ways? I, I think the, now, do you? Well, I, I don't know specifically. I, I believe that there are a number of uh, program reductions that uh, uh, would, would have to be absorbed if this budget uh, went through as, as uh, proposed. Uh, I, I certainly, and I'm su sure so, some of the rest of you have been getting calls about the, um, the enhancement uh, we used to call the gifted and talented program right. back when my kids were in school. Um, being cut is, is very unpopular. And um, as I've been saying to people, it, were we to get extra money from the state, I certainly would, would uh, consider 
sending it the school's way um, to, to deal with, with that issue among others. But in fact, what we're hearing is that we've got um, more of a deficit to, uh, to, to deal with than, rather than any extra money. Well, it's heading in the right direction based on what, what happened today, although, you know, if I had to guess, I, I would say that we're not likely to see more state aid than what we had proposed in our financial plan. We're hoping that that it'll be at least that, that amount or close to that amount, but I think it's unlikely to assume that the state aid will be a lot better and then allow that to fund some of these uh, enhancements, but I'm going to say we have to wait. We, the state budget process has to unfold. And just to be clear, what we know as of the moment, based on the assumptions that are in the financial plan, uh, if the state were to approve the budget, um, the House Ways and Means budget, we would lose another half a million dollars. So it's not clear that we're in a position to restore anything until we know clearer what the but, but State to be clear, <laughs> uh, Betsy, that the, the House did pass amendments that mitigated that reduction almost, right, almost right. in half, at, at least almost in half, and then they're still working on amendments, and then the Senate will, will do their thing. But all I'm saying is yeah. I'm, I'm not counting on us uh, getting more state aid than what we had anticipated in the financial plan. And, and all I'm trying to say is that we don't know yet. It's still in flux. Okay. We can amend the budget at a future date, but I do understand Melissa's desire for us to vote this so we can have the uh, combined reports, which I think is really the driving force at the moment. Um, and we'll certainly have the option of a supplemental report, which I think we should all be prepared for. So, all right, any more questions? Then I move favorable action on the vote beginning on, in our packet, it's identified as 11-8, but in the draft for the combined reports, it's page 8-1. And I'll just read out the um, first paragraph, and I'm not going to read the rest of it, but I will uh, indicate that we are incorporating within our vote the table at page 11-8. Just call right. it Table 1 and Table 2. All right. <laughs> we're, we're incorporating Table 1 and Table 2. How's that? Um, I move favorable action on approving the budget for fiscal year 2014 set forth in the attached tables 1 and 2, and to appropriate the amounts set forth for such fiscal year in the departments and expenditure object classifications within departments as set forth in Tables 1 and 2 subject to the following conditions. To raise all sums so appropriated unless other funding is provided herein and to establish the following authorizations which continue to page 11-20. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Benka? Aye. Selectman Goldstein? Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you. I have no doubt we will hear more on this budget. Okay, next are uh, zoning <coughs> articles, which we discussed at our last meeting, and I do not believe, uh, except for number 22, there were any... Um, well, 22 is not a zoning. That's true. All right. Uh, the zoning articles, the four zoning articles, I do not believe there were any concerns or no. reservations. No. So, um, Slyke and Venka, would you like to move the zoning articles? Yes, I would move favorable action on article number 15, a revision of the gross floor area calculation, uh, which deals with the 12-foot uh, height uh, amount, uh, limiting that um, adder to uh, one and two family buildings. Article 16. I think, um, I think uh, we really have to vote these separately. It okay. has to go into the combined reports who voted uh, for what. And Is anybody planning to I thought these no, were No, that's fine. We'll that's so, okay, I so that do I move favorable action on Article 15 as described. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Baker. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Chair votes aye. I move favorable action on Article 16, zoning lodging houses. This would allow um, 
enhanced uh, lodging houses, so-called enhanced lodging houses. I think we're going to change that name. <laughs> with uh, cooking units uh, in certain affordable lodging houses. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Chair votes aye. I would move favorable action on Article 17, Zoning Medical Marijuana. Uh, this uh, puts a uh, temporary uh, moratorium on uh, medical marijuana uh, dispensaries in Brookline until we have the opportunity to uh, revise our zoning bylaw and our other bylaws in light of pending state regulations. Uh, and that uh, moratorium uh, would go until the effective date of uh, our revised bylaws or uh, June 30th, 2014, in the event that we do not revise our bylaws. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Chair votes aye. And uh, I would move favorable action on Article Number 18, uh, zoning, daycare use, and parking, uh, and open space actually related to those use uses. Uh, this would bring our zoning bylaw in conformity with state law, and uh, also um, highlight uh, certain particular concerns with respect to safe uh, parking for uh, safe uh, pickup and drop off, and also ensure available open space uh, for daycare uses. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Benka? Aye. Selectman Goldstein? Aye. Chair votes aye. And I um, understand that there's some unresolved questions about Article 22, so. I, w I would like to move that we refer that to the Transportation Board. I think that I, Selectman Benka alerted us all earlier to the fact that there is some study going on already in this area on the B line, and I don't think we should be spending money uh, to independently um, study this if there's already some, uh, let's, let's benefit from the other people's data, and then if further study is needed, we can look at it at that time. So I'd like to refer it to the Transportation Board. Okay, so is that your motion to yes. refer to the, uh, Article 22 to the Transportation Board? It is. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Binka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Chair votes aye. And I do believe that concludes the agenda for the Board of Selectmen's meeting on Tuesday, April 23rd. And we should say we're not meeting next week. And yes, for the record, the Board of Selectmen will not be meeting on next Tuesday, April 30th, which is election day. Everybody go to the polls for both municipal and state primaries. <laughs>